Hello, my name's Peter Gattrell. I teach history at the University of Manchester, where I was a founding member of the Interdisciplinary Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, and I'm a fellow of the British Academy. Today, I'm going to talk about the 1951 United Nations Convention relating to the status of refugees, or the Refugee Convention for short. And July 28th, 2021, marks the 70th anniversary of the signing in Geneva of the Refugee Convention. And I want to explain the circumstances leading up to the convention and consider what it was designed to achieve. So let me begin by outlining the main elements of the Refugee Convention. It defined a refugee as a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. And now the reference to the refugee as an individual was significant because it departed from previous intergovernmental agreements dating back to the 1920s that named specific groups in need of protection, chiefly Russian and Armenian refugees. Now the concept of uh, persecution lay at the heart of the Refugee Convention. This wasn't a complete departure from international refugee law as it had developed before the Second World War. But in 1951, it took on fresh meaning in that persecution not only referred to the consequences of Nazi rule, but also covered the actions of newly installed communist governments in Eastern Europe. And it's a reminder that the Cold War provided part of the backdrop. Another core principle enshrined in Article 33 of the Refugee Convention is that of non refoulement which commits contracting states not to return recognized refugees to their country of origin against their will, unless on proven grounds of national security. Furthermore, under Article 31, any person who enters a contracting state illegally to claim asylum should not be punished for doing so. And other key provisions extended to basic rights, such as employment, as well as housing, education, and access to the legal system. And I, I mentioned recognition just now. The Refugee Convention stipulated that a recognized refugee had to have been affected by events occurring in Europe before the 1st of January, 1951. From that perspective, the Refugee Convention looked backwards rather than forwards and appeared to frame the refugee problem as largely a residual one and geographically restricted at that. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So how did the Refugee Convention come about? It emerged from a lengthy process that began in August 1949, following a decision by the United Nations General Assembly to establish an ad hoc drafting committee. Soviet bloc countries didn't take part on the grounds that the continued reference to persecution enabled war criminals to evade justice by being granted refuge in the West. Among the delegates who did take part in the drafting process, one issue concerned the phrase in Europe. Some countries, including the United Kingdom and France, initially advocated a broader geographical formulation but they yielded to the American position, which instead proposed taking, as they put it, one constructive step at a time, a statement designed to protect the interests of what the United States delegate called receiving countries that shouldn't be expected to write what he called a blank check. And that position won out with the proviso that signatories could opt out of the geographical limitation if they wished. A significant additional area of disagreement arose over the so-called colonial clause, whereby the major colonial powers, that's Britain, France, and Belgium, would reserve the right to decide if and when to apply the convention to all, quote, or any of the territories for the international relations of which it is responsible. 
the Indian delegation stated that it strongly opposed the insertion of this colonial clause because it was precisely, as they put it, in the colonies that violations of human rights were unfortunately most frequent. And this view found support from Lebanon, Indonesia and other countries in the global south. And it was another reminder of the politically charged context in which the Refugee Convention was debated, one in which leading European powers took colonial rule for granted. But their formulation remained in the Convention as Article 40, the so-called Territorial Application Clause. So we might then ask, what else did the Refugee Convention not do? Crucially, it did not speak of a right of asylum, but rather of the right to seek and enjoy asylum in another country, the formulation that was adopted in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Refugee Convention stipulated that each signatory could determine who was eligible for admission. And it added that reasons, quote, of a purely economic character may not be invoked. Another critical provision was that to be eligible, a refugee had to be, quote, outside the country of his nationality. This meant that people who have come to be described as internally displaced persons do not qualify for recognition. And this was clearly understood at the time. The convention took no account of large numbers of people who had been torn from their homes um, beyond Europe, around 14 million Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims moved between India and Pakistan in the immediate aftermath of partition in 47. And they were deemed not to be outside the country of their nationality and were categorized instead as national refugees, not within the convention. And other groups such as Palestinians displaced by the war of 1948 that led to the creation of the State of Israel likewise fell outside the terms of the convention. But in their case, the United Nations argued that they were already supported by a dedicated organization, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency in the Middle East, which continues to the present day. In this way, the Refugee Convention was both inclusive and exclusionary in terms of those to whom it extended protection. One other important point is worth making. Several major refugee hosting states only signed the Refugee Convention after a long delay or never signed at all. The United States did not sign until 1968 on the grounds that it reserved the right to determine through national legislation which refugees to admit. Apart from India and Pakistan, other countries that have never signed include Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, as well as Bangladesh when it achieved independence in 1971. And various reasons have been offered for their refusal to sign, including these countries' support for refugees on a voluntary basis without the need to ratify an international agreement, and their reluctance to endorse any position that might deem them to be a country of permanent refugee settlement. It's also worth pointing out that the United States delegation argued that the refugee problem in general would only respond to regional solution through the medium of regional conventions, and thus anticipated decisions taken by the Organization of African Unity with its own convention in 1969 and the 1984 Cartagena Declaration endorsed by the Organization of American States, both of which broadened the de definition of a refugee in the original convention by referring not only to persecution, but to, quote, generalized violence, foreign aggression, internal conflicts, or massive violations of human rights or other circumstances which have seriously disturbed public order. So to sum up, the 1951 Refugee Convention remains a fundamental element in international refugee law. It's been adapted, notably in 1967, when the original geographic and temporal limitations were lifted by the New York Protocol relating to the status of refugees which was signed in 1967. This decision suggests that with sufficient political will, there is scope to take account of new circumstances. So is the convention still relevant? 70 years on, 145 countries have signed the Refugee Convention, suggesting that it still plays a vital international role. Some critics argue that it belongs to a different age, some that it doesn't include internally displaced persons and others that it doesn't ensure a more equitable distribution of the global burden of the world's refugees. <laughs>
To this day, many of the world's refugees fall outside the legal protection that the convention provides. All the same, I take the view that whatever its shortcomings, it's better to have an imperfect convention rather than none, because the prospect of international agreement to create something more comprehensive is remote. Yet the Refugee Convention is a tender plant rather than a sturdy tree. Recent legislative proposals in the UK and elsewhere in Europe suggest that its core principle of protecting and securing the basic rights of refugees can never be taken for granted. And it's worth remembering that 70 years ago, serious efforts were made to define those rights that were then enshrined in international law. 